Hey, <clears throat> oh, oh, frog in the throat. Uh, Happy New Year. Welcome to the conclusion of Mad Max, the novelization. We have been reading this since the summer, and we have finally come to the end. It seems too soon. In fact, what I find kind of amazing is that we've really, much like the structure of the film, of the finished edited film, not the screenplay, the finished edited film itself, we've come to the end. And there's really not, but the third act is all pushed and condensed down into the end. I would say that we've reached the third act of the book and there's 16 pages left. It's kind of, it's incredible. It's, I guess maybe, maybe the movie wasn't as found as much in the edit as I initially thought, or perhaps if the novelization came after, I guess I should have checked before we started before I started even asking this question, if the novelization had come slowly after the book, that the book was meant to mirror more of what was represented in the movie and not the uh, a script before that came before the shooting script, which would also explain a lot. Um, so where we last left off was really dark. Uh, Jesse and Sprague um, were killed by the toe cutter and his gang, as what happens in the movies. And um, now we will read the uh the conclusion the conclusion of it all in chapter 20 here for max the days and the nights drifted into one long torment somehow he had come home to the house on the cliff once there he gave himself up wholeheartedly to misery he ate without remembering it taking whatever came to hand and leaving the debris scattered round of the once tidy kitchen. He forgot about his appearance, roaming around the house in pajama pants. Look at how pajama is spelled. P-Y-J-A-M-A. -A. That's the, I guess that's the Australian way of spelling pajamas. He, he, he forgot about his appearance, roaming around the house in pajama pants and a tattered old singlet. He didn't bother to shave and his eyes were sunken beneath the greasy hair hanging over his forehead. In moments of lucidity, when the agony that was burning the life out of him lifted for a moment, he realized that he was falling into a morass of misery and self-pity from which he might never escape. The most dangerous thing of all was that even in those moments of sanity, he didn't care about it. Other men might have raged and stormed. Others would have drunk themselves into oblivion. But Max just surrendered. He saw himself as having no will. He was a leaf thrown away by the violent storm of emo emotions boiling within. You know, it actually would have helped the film to have seen a little bit more of this represented. It's so quick. It's like two scenes. It's like a scene. It's it's a single scene. He's sitting on the beach. He's he's shaking the Tor Johnson mask from Plan 9 from Outer Space, and then he runs up and gets his gear and goes goes out into the wasteland never comes home. We, we could have, I feel like we could have used with a little bit more. There's a little bit too much uh, fat trimmed, a little bit too much economy. I, I feel like the moment could have been earned a little bit better in the film. The only thing that remained was to see his time out. Wow, that is fucking dark. The only thing that remained was to see his time out. Like, I'm just running out the clock here. My will to live is over. And listen, who could blame him with what's, what trauma he's gone through? To go through the motions like a well-trained player who, knowing the game is lost, still plays out the last few shots. Incredible metaphor. It was ironic that so small a thing, nothing more than a child's toy, should break such a powerful spell. Interesting. He was lying on the couch, lost somewhere in the night, when his hand drifted to a crack between the cushions. Absently, he dragged out an old-fashioned hand puppet and idly began to rub the soft fabric between his thumb and his forefinger. This, this right here makes me think that good old Terry watched a rough cut of the movie and then wrote this scene. I just, how could this have been in the script? He did it in a way that some people twiddle with paper clips and only as his hand slipped into the glove, did he realize what it was slowly? He lifted himself onto his elbow and using the light thrown into thrown through the kitchen door, looked closer at what he had found somewhere in the wreckage of his mind. He found a train of thought, which applied to the puppet he remembered the night Jim Goose had brought brought it around for Sprague. So the puppet comes from, so oh, it's a puppet. It's not a, oh, okay. Wow, now I feel like an idiot. Sorry. 
<laughs> it's a puppet. It's not. It's not a puppet. It's not a mask. In the movie, it's a mask, and here it's a puppet. I got it. Oops. Oops. Wow. Shut the hell up, Jeff. Uh, somewhere in the wreckage of his mind, he found a train of thought which applied to the puppet. He remembered the night Jim Goose had brought it around for Sprague and the way that they all sat around laughing and playing with it. He followed the trail and found Sprague lying on the floor, screwing his face up in mock terror as Jesse worked the, puppet, the, the puppet's lips and head. He saw them all so much alive, so full of joy, that he realized with a clarity greater than he had ever known that the tragedy had to stop somewhere. Wow, that's powerful. He saw that he was only contributing to it by refusing to go on living. Wait. He saw that he was only contributing to it by refusing to go on living, that he too was about to become another victim of the terror, which had been visited upon his friend, his child, and his wife. And he knew that he owed them all a lot more than that. That is some deep, like really well done pathos that is just not in the film, man. That needed to be better represented. You know, we know Miller did such a good job with the thing about walking with his father in the shoes and all that. Like he could have done something similar with this and he just didn't do it. He looked at the puppet again, got to his feet, switched on a light, and headed for the bathroom. He emerged as the sun began its long climb from the horizon, almost unrecognizable. His hair was trimmed, his days of growth shaven clean, and there was life in his eyes. He stood before a full-length mirror in the lounge room, checking his appearance. He found purpose. He wore black jodfers. I don't know what that is. It's probably his boots. Gleaming knee-high boots, a black leather jacket over a black shirt. Oh, yeah, black. I like that. He clad completely in black, no, no uh, sky blue shirt, clip on elbow and shoulder pads, a black peaked cap that, okay. That's a little weird. Uh, a leather revolver belt and a large bronze shield on his left breast. He walked to the door, turned to look once more at the house and went out to meet the day. Wow. <laughs> Climbing into the car, he leaned into the back and pulled the shotgun off the floor, loaded the magazine and laid it on the seat next to him. From the locked glove box, he retrieved his service issue pistol, pushed the clip into the handle, and checked the firing mechanism. Only then did he pick up the microphone from its stand, switched on the brace of radios, and called into base. Pursuit special to pursuit special to HQ control. Pursuit special to HQ control. His message his message crackled across the airwaves, rising and falling through the miles, causing every police unit tuned in to sit up and take notice finally hq control acknowledged him and there wasn't a police officer listening who didn't wonder what the message would be pursuit special here message to mcafee tell him i'm on the road request permission to undertake special inquiries over roger pursuit special the operator replied after a pause and max welcome back dude that is so fun dude that has me so pumped the fuck up wow Max clicked the mic back onto its stand, gunned the motor, and head headed towards the highway. Okay, I believe this is the fun. Let me check. I believe we're at the final chapter of the book. No, no, never mind. Never mind. Um, he began to chapter 21. He began to retrace the, the bitumen path that he and Jess had followed on their last journey. It could have brought back heart that it could have brought back heart rendering memories if he'd allowed it, but he decided while he was still searching out his uniform to close forever, the compartment of his mind containing everything related to his wife and child. That is so sad. He was, he told himself developing a dispassionate fantasy, a police officer above and beyond everything else. He was set out on another job, admittedly a difficult assignment, but absolutely nothing to do with him personally. There were men to be hunted down and it was his job to do it. Nothing more. He punished the car through the miles, tearing the tires out over the bitumen. I guess that's like concrete and staring almost unseeing down the road ahead. He bypassed most of the, out of the way stops where in what now seemed like another life, a different Max had camped with Jesse and Sprague. He was headed for the garage where he had the tire repaired. 
He found it without difficulty. He allowed no emotion to intrude as he approached it. He pulled the car up outside the workshop, and before <clears throat> the young mechanic could lay down his tools, Max was out of his car striding across the concrete. It was dim inside the workshop. The only light came from a couple of hanging spots that cast yellow circles on a car under repair. As Max moved through the paraphernalia of the shop, picking his way through the small alleyways between machinery, tuning devices, and the debris of a hundred wrecks, he heard the grease monkey call out, If that's you, Bubba, I won't be finished on the grunt until this afternoon. Max replied by soundlessly picking up a tire lever and lying on a bench and heading for the arc lights and the voice. Is that you, Bubba? Oh, this is the this is the grease monkey. Right. That scene where, where he's asking about the guy. Wow. I'm like like spacing out. I thought he went back to HQ. Gotcha. Gotcha. So the voice should be different. Is that you, Bubba? That's how it kind of sounds. The mechanic replied as he wiped his hands on a piece of oily cloth. He came towards Max and pulled up a short and pulled up short as they met face to face in a small clearing between the two jacked up cars. Hey, what's this? You and me are going to have a little talk about a guy called the Toe Cutter and his friend Bubba Zanetti. I, I, I never heard of them. Max's gloved hand shot out and caught him full fist on the cheekbone. Of course you haven't. You just call everybody Bubba, don't you? And you always help bikies who roll in looking for people, don't you? Max grabbed him by the shirt and brought the tire lever into his line of vision. Now I want to know about these tattooed hoons. And who else is with them, okay? You know what's interesting? In a way, the mechanic, without knowing it, is the reason why uh, Jesse and Sprague are dead to begin with. F funny enough. Not funny enough. Ironically enough. The mechanic screwed up his face, his eyes darting to the tire lever. Look, man, I just mind my own business. I don't know nothing. Max swung the lever down on the kid's forearm, feeling the jolt through his own body as it bounced off bone. The kid howled in pain, and tears sprang from his eyes. Once the grease monkey regained his presence of mind, he began to whimper. They'll, they'll kill me, honest. I don't know what they've done, but they'll waste me if they find out as much as I talk to you. Listen, mister, I didn't know you were a cop. Max lifted the tire lever again and felt the kid shake in his grip. First off, we get the name straight and I'll get you started, right? The kid couldn't take his eyes off the metal bar. The leader's the toe cutter, right? The kid nodded and one of his lieutenants was called the Knight Rider, except that he's dead. He nodded again. And then, Max continued, we've got Bubba Zanetti and someone called Johnny the Boy. Who else? The mechanic began to waver about the wisdom of telling the bronze anymore. Max tightened his grip on his overalls and began to swing the tire lever through the full arc. <laughs> no, don't! There's Diabondo and another one called Mud Guts! I mean, why would the names matter ultimately? Like, why would the names even matter to Max? Like, he he doesn't, I mean, it's it, it's kind of like, an, if anything, he just needs to know their location. Like, it's not like he can, like, look these people up in a database, really, I don't think. Uh, also interesting that the, the car, he's not under the car. It, he's just got his hand out under the thing. <laughs> um it was as if he was mesmerized by the lever hanging in the air, threatening at any moment to split his skull. Oh, maybe maybe I read that wrong. And clunk, he's pretty simple. That's the lot. That's the inner circle. Max dropped the lever towards the crown of the grease monkey's head. Honest, I swear to God, except for Kundalini. He's in the hospital, and he ain't got a hand no more. Max threw him aside, leaving him sprawled against the bonnet, nursing his smashed arm. He began, yeah, smashed star. I, I don't, I don't know. I can't, I, I'm trying to picture the action that's presented here as opposed to the movie. And I can't, um, he began to walk out of the workshop, still carrying the tire lever. When suddenly he stopped, swung on his heel and retraced his steps. The kid began to cower away, trying to climb over the car, lose, lost in his footing and fell spread Eagle on the bonnet with Max standing over him. Where will I find them? Yeah, like, duh. Like, we, you already knew the names, right? You already knew the names because you, um, because you friggin', uh, because you, we've been talking about them the whole time. You were talking about them with Jesse. Jesse knew the names. Uh, McAfee knew the names. You just need to know where to find them. So, this whole first part, you didn't even need to ask him that. <laughs> where will I find them? The kid began to blubber. Max tore into him with his eyes. The, the coast highway, about 30 miles north, is a turf, and they always end up there, or at some of the beaches nearby. 
Max had finished with him. It took several hours and an enormous amount of luck, but he discovered them at a tiny resort town 40-odd miles up the coast. Isn't it amazing how this one sentence, it took several hours and an enormous amount of luck, but he discovered them at a tiny resort town 40-odd miles up the coast, literally took up an entire lengthy chapter of them stalking Jesse in book form. Like, it just blows my mind. If anything, wh why not f invert it? They found Jesse and they went after her and stalked her. Instead, devote a whole chapter to that just alone. Max hunting them down. It would have made the, it would have given more meat to the third the third act of the movie. When he left the garage, he decided that his most sensible course was to follow the old minor road that linked the straggling beachside townships and then backtrack down the coast highways until he found them. He'd almost decided to give the beaten up road away and was ready to retrace his steps on the highway when he noticed a, decay, a decaying sign. In, okay, so we got a little bit more. We get a we get a um, a paragraph about it. Um, maybe it was just so sorry. The, uh, 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 when he noticed a decaying sign indicating two townships within the next 10 miles. Maybe it was just the feeling that gamblers sometimes get before they pick up their hand. Maybe it was simply the determination of a good cop, but Max tramped his foot down and headed farther north. He was in and out of the first township before he could blink. It was no more than a straggling line of decrepit old shops that looked as though they'd been deserted for years. The next, though... Still only a tiny dot on any map was more substantial. It had grown around an intersection and possessed an air of vitality. Cars were parked in the street. Houses dotted a far hillside with a panoramic view over a pretty little cove on the beach. Children were playing at the water's edge. Max slowed his car, searching the verandas. Veranda! A couple of women were going about their shopping. He turned to examine the rest of the town, and almost immediately he saw them. Six black superbikes parked in the line out front of the Bayview Hotel. They could, of course, belong to anyone, but he knew by all his instincts that he had found what he was looking for. He didn't feel any excitement or fear. It was as if an important piece of machinery had at last been fitted into place. Without emotion, his mind, like an efficient, smoothly functioning mechanism, began to compute all the variables and churn out answers. He drove past the hotel, accelerating so that he was on the other side as quickly as possible without drawing attention to himself. A couple of hundred yards up the street, he found exactly what he was looking for, a side alley opposite of the hotel. He cruised past it, slid the car into reverse and rolled in with the car's nose facing the street. He was far enough back in the alley to avoid any but the most careful scrutiny, and yet he could still see the bikes. Max waited without taking his eyes off the front door of the hotel. Noon came and went. This is literally, okay, wow, not only was I wrong, they do go into all this detail, but this is literally an inverse of the other chapter. Like, why do we need two chapters devoted to this? This is the, this is the, the height of the movie, man. This is the height of the fucking movie. Come on. Noon came and went. Men drifted into town and sought out the bar for a drink on a counter lunch. The car was oppressively hot, but Max didn't shy. Max didn't shed any of his uniform. He still looked as though he was on parade. The lunch hour drinkers had drifted away by the time his prey emerged. They stumbled out of the door, pushing each other and staggering slightly into the bright sunlight. Max's mind accepted and processed the information. They'd obviously been there all morning and were far enough gone to be careless. He didn't move. As they mounted their bikes, he picked out those he could identify and tried to pin their names, pin the names on the others. Why are the names important though? They're literally not important. With the toe cutter leading the way, they backed out unsteadily and turn their machines through 90 degrees to face up the road drunk they might have been but they still could hold the bikes upright and kick over the starters with more or less simultaneous roar the engines burst into life and they wound out their throttles they passed the spot where max was sitting in his pursuit special without so much as a sideway glance and headed for the coast highway Max knew he felt at home out there on, on the open asphalt. He eased his car into the street, allowing them plenty of space, and then set off sedately behind. 
way ahead across several dips and curves into the road. He could see them bunched together. Making an accurate estimate of their speed, he let his needle hover around 75, not too fast to overtake them, but not slow enough to let them get away. Although the rush of air and speed started to restore some sort of order to their jangled brains, none of the gang bothered to look behind. After all, wasn't this their territory? Max burbled along, losing them from the sight for a few minutes on the end, but always spotting them again. As if locked together by an invisible bond, the car and the bikes churned through the countryside to the intersection of the access road and the coast highway. At last, in the distance, Max could see an eight-laned bitumen threaded across the landscape. He pushed his foot down, closing the gap between him and his quarry. The one thing he didn't want was to turn the wrong way onto the highway and lose them. Once again, he was in luck. The access road swept up a hill and then ran as straight as a die on the other side till it joined the highway. Just over the crest, Max tramped on his brakes, threw his car into reverse, and rocketed back on backwards onto the gravel of the shoulder at the top. He sat there watching. The six bikes beetled closer and closer to the wide ribbon of asphalt, and finally, reaching it, turned their wheels north. He leant forward and twisted the key into the ignition. They were on the open highway now, and the only law of the road. And only the law of the road would apply. He swung to the center of the road, tramped his foot to the floor, and silently sung the praise of the mechanics who put his monstrous machine together. He was hitting 140 miles an hour with more in reserve when he sighted them again. His car thundered down the highway, and they were clearer by the second, spread across two lanes, traveling no better than the ton. He closed in on them at an incredible speed. The nose of his vehicle flattened over the road, the spoilers keeping his rear end clamped tight. The mass of wheels and their blasting engine created a deafening roar. Even in the steel cocoon of the cabin, Max sat back, arms straight, holding the wheel lightly in his hands. He swept over a crest, seeing them plainly in the dip below him, and aimed the car between the two files hoping to take them all at once, the way that a bowling ball drops skittles in a strike. Maybe the noise, maybe a sixth road sense made Mudguts riding at the back look in his rearview mirror. He saw Max hurtling down the hill behind them, thinking quickly, an incredible achievement considering the amount of beer he drunk. He opened his throttle, threw his bike to his right, and screamed through the middle of the other five, yelling, and tossing his head behind him. As soon as he went through the pack, he veered off to the left and headed for the shoulder of the road, guessing that at that speed, their pursuer would be loath to follow. Realizing that mud guts wasn't just a skylarking, wasn't just skylarking, the others looked in their mirrors within a second of each other to find the hurling black projectile almost upon them. In a panic, they peeled off in all directions, hurling their weight against the frames of their bikes, laying them over till the sparks flew from their toe caps. Max didn't miss them all. He caught Johnny the boy's rear wheel with his front guard and sent him ca careering out of control up the road, across the outside lane, over the gravel, and into a tumbling, sprawling mess in the scrub. Before he knew it, Max was through the scattered pack. His mind computed the new information and told him to keep going. He had all the time in the world. The five who were who were still on their bikes became suddenly very, very sober. They watched Max disappear into the distance as if he were chasing the world land speed record and then gathered into a knot at the roadside slowly turning about and the road down the gravel each keeping an eye pinned on his mirror to the spot where johnny lay prone in the dirt i gotta tell you you know like this does not translate well in novel form like you have to, it, it's like i don't know man the descriptive language it's just you really have to like sit and picture everything it's it's kind of annoying, actually. Like this, this is a movie. This is not a book. You can't do this in a book. You have to be, you have to, you can't focus on this kind of action in a book. How about that? That's what it is. That's what it really is. 
with encouragement, Johnny managed to raise himself to a sitting position, or at least you need a graphic novel or something. I don't know. With encouragement, Johnny managed to raise himself to a sitting position, nursing his bruised chest and tentatively feeling the grazes and abrasions that modeled his body. The bike was in much worse shape than he was. And after a few abortive attempts to get it upright, they gave it way. So he, Johnny is able to escape. Uh, the tow cutter took command. Johnny, you have to wait here while we go and teach our friend a lesson he won't live to remember. Johnny nodded his head, thankfully, thankful that he had a chance to recover in peace. The others leapt up on their bikes and ro rolled over the scrub and gravel. All right, the tow cutter said. Let's take the boy racer. <coughs> His front wheel hit the tarmac and a shower of gravel sprayed over his following lieutenants. Max was miles ahead of them. He had picked his spot carefully. The road crossed a river about 30 feet below, then swung into a long, tight hand curve. He parked on the side of the road, then scrambled up a steep hill from which he could see for miles down the road. He stood at the top of the ridge, an imposing figure in his all-black uniform, and searched the asphalt for the first sign of them. Idly, he played with the butt of the revolver at his hip. <laughs> he played with the butt. <laughs> he played with the butt. It's right here. Look, he played with the butt. <laughs> Idly, he played with the butt of the revolver at his hip, watching and waiting. Then he saw them. Without any haste, he clambered down the hill, walking along the road till he could see the bridge. He fixed his sight on a spot. We kind of see this a little bit in the movie. And by the way, there's no mention of the double barrel shotgun. It's just not, I mean, and it, there's no real scene in the movie either. I think I think that happens in a deleted scene that where he, he saws the, the shotgun in half or whatever. He fixed his sight on a spot several miles beyond it. The calculator in his skull, the calculator in his skull told him that when he saw them there, he'd have to move. Patiently, he waited. When the tow cutter passed his mark, he turned on his heel and sprinted. He had left the door open. By the time he snapped it shut, he had the engine started, letting the revs build up to a frightening crescendo before he set the beast free. The five hoons thundered onto the bridge at close to 120 miles an hour. Max was traveling considerably slower, but he had surprise on his side. The calculator hadn't let him down. He was out of the curve and dead in front of them before they realized what was happening. Yeah, so he kind of ambushes them. The tow cutter managed with luck, with lucky driving to avoid the black monster by a few inches. Clunk and Diabondo weren't so fortunate. Clunk threw his bike to the right and fell front. Fender, uh, fr and that. Cl Clunk threw his bike to the right and felt the front fender take off his rear wheel he was soaring and somersaulting through the air looking for all the world as though he had been drop kicked over the parapet of the bridge clunk was alive the moment before he hit the water and dead the moment after so we see that happen in the movie too the force of the impact the trajectory of his flight in space the speed at which he spun the angle at which his body hit the water all added up to a very simple result. He snapped his neck. Diabondo avoided Max's wild onslaught. He braked, veered to the right, and seeing the guardrail looming straight in front of him, attempted to eject himself from his seat. Whether propelled by agility or the crashing impact as the front forks buried themselves into the steel rail, Diabondo, too, somersaulted through the air, hitting the water feet first and breaking his leg. His unconscious body floated face up with the current. Max heard weeks later that the young larrikin had dragged himself ashore miles downstream and otherwise unharmed, spent almost three days nursing his broken leg before he was lucky enough to be found by a group of hunters. Gangrene had set in, in his, in, in his, into his infected leg and the doctors amputated it above the knee. So that's interesting. It says Max had heard weeks later because the movie ends with him just driving off into the wasteland, but it seems sounds like maybe, you know, I don't know. There doesn't really say what happens in the movie. It's just kind of implied he just drives off into the wasteland. I guess he could have gone back to some sort of civilian life before, you know, the shit hits the fan and turns into the road warrior. I don't know. But Max didn't spare a thought for Diabondo as he spun like a doll in the air. The impact of the, of the collision with Clunk had ruined his aim and allowed Mudguts and Bubba Zanetti to take wild, evasive action.
Once again, Max was past the pack, and the tow cutter and his two lieutenants had recovered their equilibrium with barely a sideways glance at the spot on the bridge where their masts disappeared. They laid their bikes on the long, sweeping curve. Max brought his thundering machine to a halt, swung it into a tight U-turn, and roared back to the center of the bridge. Calmly, he stepped out of the car and strode to the parapet where the remains of Diabondo's bike were wedged between the steel struts. He looked down and saw the two bodies floating lazily apart in the water, allowed his mind to absorb this information, and returned to his car. The tow, the tow cutter was toying with the idea of stopping to confer with his two remaining troopers when he picked up the black dot of Max's ducko in the rearview mirror. This ain't no boy racer after all, he thought. And as he paid grudging admiration to the talent, cunning, and tenacity of their tormentor, realizing realization dawned. He cursed himself for his stupidity. Only one person with the ability and the reason to take them on and to do it so well, it was the bronze. It was Max. So he didn't know that whole time it was Max. Now he realizes, interesting as well, Mad Max and the toe cutter doing battle on the bitumen. It had to happen, he thought. Everything had led to this. Okay, so I initially was going to keep going. There's there's a lot more. There's, there's, there's plenty more, man. There, there's enough for one more of these half-hour episodes. And I think these are a lot more digestible in half-hour chunks. So we're going to end it there. Um, in case you didn't know, Riot Stickers is the sponsor of our channel, and we have a brand new promotion with Riot Stickers where you can get uh, 200 die cut stickers for $69. Um, these stickers are weatherproof. They have a UV coating. You can't go wrong with 200 die cut stickers. The link is down in the description at uh, fromus.com backslash, sorry, not fromus.com, riotstickers.com backslash fromus, duh, derp, deep. And, um, and yeah. That's that's all we got for you today. Let's play the uh, the little theme song, and we'll uh, we'll see you next time with the co true conclusion of Mad Max: The Novelization. Peace and hair grease.